We are going to talk about something that is very exciting, and we've all heard about it, the walls of Jericho. In, in, in uh, children's church, my wife tells me that there is a song that talks about the walls of Jericho, and you go like this, come tumbling down. Well, it's very lucky that I'm not going to sing that today, because that could get real ugly. But we are going to talk about Jericho, but first, I want to take us back to what we talked about last week, and that was the parting of the Red Sea. God had promised the people, the Israelites, that when they were taken out of slavery from Egypt, when Moses let them out, parted the Red Sea, they were on their way to the land flowering with milk and honey. And we see that in Exodus 3.8. So here they are. And how many people were there? A few million. Right? So here they are. They're following Moses. And they get to a place called Berna. And there at Berna, they stop and they camp. And what happens is they decide that they need to send out some spies out to the land of Canaan. That's the promised land. So what they do, they pick 12 people, one from each of the 12 tribes, to go out to the land of Canaan and investigate it, explore. Because there's people living there. And they want to know what kind of resistance they're going to get. So they leave. The 12 spies, they go out to the land of Canaan. They're gone for 40 days. When they get back, Moses says to him, well, what did you find? Ten of the spies said, they're huge people. I felt like a grasshopper next to them. They're big. They're, they're tough. We aren't going to be able to overcome those people. And ten of those spies agreed. Ten of those spies said, yeah, that's right. The only two that disagreed was Joshua and Caleb, the only two that disagreed. But majority rules, so what they did, they said to God basically, yeah, we're not going to go in right now because those are bad people and we can't conquer them. Wait a minute. Here we go again. God had already promised the land to them, but here they sit and go, nah, we can't go in. God's going to take care of everything. God's going to take care of those opponents. God's going to take care of those people. No, no. You know, why would you bring us out to the desert, Moses, just to die? Didn't we hear that before last week? When they went to the Red Sea, you had the Red Sea in front of them. You had the Egyptian army coming after them. And they say, gee, Moses, why would you bring us out here to die? There's plenty of land in Egypt. We could have been buried there. So now again... The Israelites are complaining. Again. When do they stop? They don't. They never stop. And if you look through the entire Old Testament, all they do is complain. So God gets mad. And God says to Moses, I'm done with this. I'm done with these people. I'm done. Moses says, no, just calm down, God. Just give them a break here. Show a little grace. God says, okay, I'll tell you what. Here's what I'll do. For every day that those spies were gone, I'm going to have a year added to you going into that promised land. So they were gone 40 days, 40 years. You've heard this people say they were in the wilderness for 40 years. This is where it started. God says, No, you're not going in. And the whole idea behind this is that the people that were complaining would die off, including Moses. Moses had lost control. So all of those people that were complaining died. Now you have their offsprings coming up. And they do something a little different. They praise God. Oh, go figure. They believe 
that God is going to do something. They believe that God is going to go into that promised land and he will slay any enemy. He believes it. They believe it. They have a new leader, one of the spies, Joshua. Why didn't Joshua die? Because Joshua believed that God would do exactly what God said he would do. So off they go. So now, they get to the Jordan River. They're going to Jericho. Jericho is on the other side of the Jordan River. They have got to pass through the Jordan River. You know who shows up? Never believe this. God. Joshua 3, 14. I want to read this to you. So when the people broke camp to cross the Jordan, the priests carrying the Ark of the Covenant. Do we know what the Ark of the Covenant is? An Ark is a box. Noah's Ark, it's a wooden box. And the covenant is the Ten Commandments, the law of God, the covenant that he had with his people. So it's a box that was laid over with gold, and the tablets are sitting inside the box. That's the Ark of the Covenant. But it was just not wood. It was overlaid with gold. It was beautiful. And men carried it with, with long beams, and they walked with the Ark of the Covenant. Wherever they stopped, they would pitch a tent, and the Ark would go into that tent. And that was Holy Land there. Okay, let's continue. Now, the Jordan is at flood state during this harvest. Yet, as soon as the priest who carried the Ark reached the Jordan and their feet touched the water's edge, the water from upstream stopped flowing. This time, God didn't part water. He just stopped it from flowing. Because we're not in a sea. We're in a river. It piled up in a heap of a great distance away at the town of Abram in the vicinity where the water was flowing down to the sea, the Dead Sea, was completely cut off. So the people crossed over the opposite side to Jericho. The priest who carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stopped in the middle of the Jordan. So he stopped and stood there on dry ground while all Israel passed by until the whole nation had completely crossed the Jordan. And let's all say dry ground. Dry ground. Dry ground. Dry, dry, Thank you for saying it, because I can't. So now, they're outside of the city of Jericho. Now, we talk about the walls. How big are the walls? The walls are 14 feet in depth, thick. That's how thick they are. People actually live in the wall of the city. And it's about, roughly, archaeologists figure it was 49 feet high including the stones on top and how they arched it. But they arched it out. It was impenetrable. Nobody could breach it. Back then, if you wanted to breach a city wall, what they would do, the, the attackers would bring in dirt, and they'd just build the dirt up to got to the point where they could jump over, which usually caused a lot of people that were building that little dirt to die. So a lot of casualties there. Sometimes they'd try to set the wall on fire to bring it to a point where they might be able to push it down. And that, too, also caused a lot of casualties. So it's impenetrable, impenetrable. And it's self-contained. It had its own water. It had its own crops. It had everything. The city of Jericho had everything. They didn't have to go outside the walls for anything. Everything was within the cities. But here's interesting. I want to go back to Moses. Remember when God spoke to Moses in Exodus, the burning bush? Remember that? I want to go back to that just for a moment. And it says 
And I, okay, here it is. It says in Exodus 3, 5, do not come any closer. God is talking to Moses. Remember the burning bush we talked about. Take off your sandals because you are on holy ground. God talked to Moses. He was in the burning bush. Take off your sandals. You're on holy ground. Now, we look at Joshua 5, 13. And there is a man, just before they go into the town, there is a man that says, Now it came about when Joshua was by Jericho that he lifted up his eyes and look and behold, a man was standing opposite him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said to him, are you for us or are you our adversary? Okay, this is in Joshua 5.13. So Joshua sees this man standing there walks up to him, are you for us or against us? And he says, the man says, no, rather, I indeed come now as captain of the host of the Lord. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and bowed down and said to him, what have you, Lord, to say to your servant? Wait a minute. Who is this man? The captain of the Lord host said to Joshua, remove your sandals from your feet, for this place you are standing is on holy ground. Didn't we hear that earlier? With Moses, the burning bush said to Moses, take off your sandals, you're on holy ground. We see it again in Joshua. Why? Who was the man with the sword? Jesus. The man with the sword was Jesus 1,400 years before Jesus was born. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, three is one. Jesus is standing there in the flesh with the sword, talking to Joshua 1,400 years before he was born. Just a little tidbit of information for you. I was reading and went, oh my, what's this? I've heard this before. Yeah, I said it last week. Okay, so now. The man tells him, no problem, it is yours. The man standing there, Jesus says to him, God says to him, it's yours, the land is yours. Go and take it, it's already yours. Now see, God says these things to us, and they said it to the Israelites, but the Israelites stumble and stammer and mess around and don't do what he says. They don't have the faith to believe that God, when he says it's yours, it's yours. They want to send out spies, they want to check it out. Stop checking out God. If God says, it's yours, it's yours. Boom, end of story. I digressed. Then the Lord said to Joshua, this is from 6-2. See, I have delivered Jericho into your hands. It's already been delivered. You haven't picked up a, uh, a spear. You haven't picked up a sword. You already have it. Along with this king and all its fighting men. March around the city once with the armed men. Do this six days. So, have seven priests carry the trumpets of ram horns in front of the ark. So the ark's going to go around the city. And on the seventh day, march around the city seven times. So on the seventh day, they're going to do the same thing seven times, blowing the trumpets. Then you hear the sound, a long blast on the trumpets. Have the whole army give a loud shout. Then the walls of Jericho came tumbling down. Who lord? Good stuff. Seven days around, last day. Six days around, last day, seventh day. Go around, blow the horns. Boom. 
walls come tumbling down. Just carry that story a little bit farther. Everybody except one prostitute and her family and friends died. Everybody's dead. That's the power of God. If he tells you he's going to do something, don't doubt him. If he can tell you a rat can pull a house, don't doubt him. Hook the rat up. Boom. Done. So, what have we learned from this little Jericho deal? Where the walls came tumbling down. There's a vast difference between the way man looks at things and the way God looks at things. And we have to always remember that because we look at something and say, oh, we can't jump over that. God says, yes, you can. Though militarily, it was irrational to assault this big city of Jericho in the manner in which they did. To just run around it a few times, blowing horns, carrying the covenant. And then on the last day, everybody screams and the walls come tumbling down. That doesn't even sound rational. But that's what was God's instructions. That's what he told Joshua what to do. That was his instructions. Why doubt it? Again, let's hook up that rat. He can blow that house down. If God says he can, he can. Secondly, the power of God is supernatural. It is beyond our comprehension. The walls of Jericho fell, and they fell instantly under the sheer word of God. They were collapsed. And thirdly, there's an uncompromising relationship between grace of God and faith and obedience to him in your faith. Scripture tells us in Hebrews 11.30, By faith the walls of Jericho fell after the people had marched around them for seven days. They fell. Though militarily, didn't make any sense. And sometimes, when God speaks to us, it makes no sense. And we don't get it. But that doesn't mean that God is not doing what God does. It just doesn't make sense. But yes, it does at the end of the day. It'll all make sense because God makes it very clear to us. James 5, 2, 26. I love the book of James. It says, as the body is without spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. Simply put, it's not enough to believe in God and then live a life that is not holy and pleasing to God, to live a life that is not godly. If we truly love God and we truly desire what God has in store for us, then we must be obedient to him. Our faith needs to be put to work. We have a default and that default is not listening to other people. We did it when we were children, listening to our parents. We would default to not listening. And our parents would say, are you listening to me? Did you hear a word I said? Anybody relate to that? Can anybody relate to saying that? That's kind of how God looks at us. He says, are you listening to me? The Israelites didn't. They perished. The question becomes, are you listening to him? Are you listening to what God's telling you to do? And it's not an audible voice that says, Doug, do this. He'll bring people around us who will talk to us. He'll whisper to us when we're in the shower. He'll talk to us just before we close our eyes to go to sleep at night. It's that thought that pops into your head that there's no reason for that thought to be in your head. Has that ever happened to you? Everybody's got to be sick of their Yeah, maybe that was God. And the stronger your faith becomes, 
the more often you will hear that thought, that word. More often that one person will just walk into your life and say something or do something and go, oh my, that's a sign from God. But if we don't have a relationship with him, it'll never happen. If we have true faith, we are compelled to obey God. God will give us victory over our enemies. God will give us victory over our circumstances. God will give us victory over anything that we need him to do because God is who he says he is and he does exactly what he says he will do. And if we remember that, we will be victorious in our lives. Ephesians 2, 8 seed says, For it is by the grace you have been saved through faith. It is not from ourselves, but it is through the gift of God. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for this day. I thank you for all the people that have come to worship you today and all the people online today that have come to worship you. We do struggle. Sometimes we're like the Israelites. We just can't see the forest through the trees. Sometimes we just think you're not big enough to handle things for us, and we have to take it upon ourselves to make our own decisions. Often, Lord, those decisions are so ungodly and so wrong and so opposite of what you are saying and what you're doing for us. We can certainly understand how sometimes you get a little irritated with us, Lord, and I apologize for that, and I ask that you forgive, give us, forgive us for that. But Lord, help us to be more like you in all that we say and all that we do. You are supernatural. We can't, we can't understand how you do things, but you do them. We see the walls of Jericho come down simply because you said they would. So jump into my heart, Lord. Jump into the heart of those around me those within the congregation and online, and grow their faith that you can do all things. All things are made possible for those that believe. Lord, we love you and praise you. Give all the glory to you. In Jesus' precious name we pray. And everyone said, amen. Hello, my name is Doug Doms. I'm the executive pastor here at the Movement Church. It is through your blessings that this ministry continues to reach out and touch lives that might not have been touched otherwise. If you want to continue to support our ministry, please go to movementchurch.community and please remember to tell your friends, go on social media, tell your friends at Movement 937. God bless you and have a wonderful day and thanks again.